Hello and welcome to Wizards, Warriors and Words, a fantasy writing advice podcast. I'm Jed Hearn, author of Fires of the Dead. Hi, Jed. It's me, Dirk. <laughs> I'm Dirk Ashton, author of the Paternus Trilogy. I am Michael R. Fletcher, author of Crazy Books. <laughs> I'm Rob J. Hayes, author of The War Eternal Trilogy. And we are joined for the second week in a row by a special guest, RJ Barker. RJ, welcome to the show. Uh, when you can't hear it, and we're not here, they say, introducing special guest, RJ Barker. And they don't say that, which makes me feel like it's Columbo and I'm going to be murdered. <laughs> 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 You're just the red shirt in this episode, aren't you? Oh, nice stuff. <laughs> RJ, be honest, you... that's actually a cardboard cutout of Fletcher. He's behind you right now with a knife. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm the author of that, The Bone Ships and The Wounded Kingdom trilogy, which I've got the Italian one of there it's, it's with a skull on it. It is. So we love a skull. All right. So, uh, first of all, this is totally not being recorded in the same session as last episode because RJ is wearing a hat and he wasn't wearing a hat last week. So definitely <laughs> a different week. Um, and this episode is all about fight scenes. So uh, who wants to kick off talking about fight scenes? When are they, I suppose, um, necessary in novels? Pretty basic open-ended question. But um, when do you kind of think they are a good time uh, or a good tool to deploy in your kind of creative writing toolkit? Whenever you sort of like hit a slow part and you're not sure what comes next, you just sort of big fight, kill somebody off, move on. <laughs> this is a short episode. Wait, episode done. <laughs> That's actually was... like not a bad idea. Like that is when, yeah, I often find that like if a book is lagging or whatever, then it, there is a meaningful fight scene coming along. Um, it definitely does kind of lift everything uh, from there. So one of the things we were talking about a little bit last week is um, how RJ does something a bit different with his fight scenes. Uh, and do you want to just talk us through what that is for people who maybe didn't listen last week? Yeah, I, why didn't they listen? What's wrong with them? I don't know. Um, in, in the Wounded Kingdom books, where, which are first person narrated, when, when they go in, it's written in first person past tense, but when they go into fight scenes, of scenes where there's magic involved, it goes into first person present tense to create a, a sense of immediacy and also a, a slight sense of there being something wrong or different in you as the reader. And, and we're saying how not everyone will notice that happening, they'll just notice there is something different. But that it, it's all about immediacy and, and slight altered states, which, which is something that interests me. That's why I do it. But I'm um, I always think fight scenes are, are like the the pressure release valve of narrative. Yeah. You, you build it up and you build it up and then, then you, you break it. But it doesn't have to be a, I mean, it's a point of conflict. It doesn't have to be a fight scene, but that's, that's what I think of most. That's a really good definition because I think a lot of uh, newer authors in particular think that if you just put a fight scene in, it's going to be interesting and it's going to hold readers' attention. But a lot of the times, like fight scenes can sometimes be pretty monotonous to read unless there is some setup done beforehand. So Mike, do you want to maybe talk a little bit about how you kind of um, make fight scenes uh, meaningful, I suppose? Oh, meaningful. I don't really mm. do meaningful. I'm, I'm more uh, like bubblegum kind of, you know, fantasy. Uh, so for me, a fight scene, uh, I just like, I like action movies, okay? So I watch the fight scene as an action movie in my head before writing it. I see, see from a bunch of different angles, uh, like all the actions have to kind of make sense uh, in 3D space for me. Uh, so I basically Michael Bay the fuck out of this fight scene. To me, uh, the fight scene is, you know, there's your story going along and it's a nice romantic comedy like Beyond Redemption or something. And then I hit you with a Michael Bay moment and it's boom, slow motion panoramic shot with an orange filter on the camera, blood, blood, guts. Um, don't forget the bombs. If it's a Michael Bay, you've got to have the, the occasional just bomb. Yeah, I mean, working the helicopter in was awkward, <laughs> but you know, you do what you got to do. So that, that's me. I just try and Michael Bay the shit out of the uh, the fight scenes, make it a an action movie. What about you, Dirk? What's your approach with fight scenes? Um, 
Well, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot been talked about fight scenes, you know, and uh, the, the actual, especially like medieval fight scenes, actually what people can really do with swords, the physicality, the, the step-by-step, -step, how they turn, how they hold, how they flip, you know, how they stab. Um, and uh, there are authors that do that incredibly well and very realistically. Uh, Miles Cameron, Christian Cameron, um, comes to mind immediately. He's extremely good at that. Yeah, and it helps that he uh, that he is also, you know, that, that's what he does. I mean, he's he's really into uh, reenactment, but actual uh, learning uh, how to fight with um, swords and spears and that kinds of thing. Um, I don't do that as much. I try not to. Now my characters are overpowered. They're all OP basically. Um, so their physicality is going to be different. Um, I just try to catch shots. I think my fight scenes uh, in terms of, I mean, I'm a filmmaker at heart and by training um, and a screenwriter. So I do things very and very often in screenplays you say fight scene and joe wins you know by stabbing him through the heart and then you leave it to the director but i can't do that so i see them in terms of shots and movement i write in terms of a float kind of a floating camera around multi different multiple different characters um and in terms of shots uh, so I see the whole thing in my head and then I have to choose which bits I show, right? Like which shots and how long they go on. It's like editing. It's like shooting and editing a film. I have to pick the, I, I pick the little piece of the show. And very often they don't have a lot of detail uh, mm -hmm. in exactly what happens and exactly how it happens. Um, and so far, that's the one thing that has not been criticized yet, except for that my battle and fight scenes, the only criticism. Is my we lost on those. Oh, Hello? I approach. Sorry, Dirk, we just, you just uh, cut out for about five seconds. Fight you scenes, could just... you've got to have. Oh, you're back now. is it better now? Yeah, you're good now. Better now. Um, I have, I want to have a reason for fight scenes. I have read books and we've probably all read books where the is that, oh, fight scene goes here, right? Fight scene goes here. It's been too long. I haven't had a fight scene, so I have to throw one in. And I, some books, I can really feel that. Um, I'm called out with my and, uh, uh, Never Die series though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, because yours is about fight scenes. I mean, it's, you know, it's in that tradition where that's what that's about, you know. Uh, so I never felt that in those. Um, actually, it's really funny, but uh, Joe Abercrombie's um, uh, first book. Um, the Blade Itself. It, yeah, uh, I felt that early on in the book. I felt, okay, fight scene needs to go here. Fight scene needs to go here. But then that went away as he went on and, and wrote the book. Um, and I love those books, but I actually felt that. I was like, okay, fight scene goes here. Got to have a fight scene here. Um, but then, then that, that actually went away as he went on in the books and his later books are not like that at all. So that's kind of my approach. Very, I hate cinematic. This book was very cinematic, but that's my approach to fight scenes. Mm. I see the whole thing play out in a master shot and then I choose the little pieces. That I think I'm that's talk about. a really good point that you bring up about like there has to be a reason for it and you have to make it feel like I, I suppose that's what I was sort of aiming at before when I was saying like meaningful. Meaningful is probably like a bit of a wrong word for it but it definitely makes a huge difference when there is stakes and kind of character motivations that are justifying the fight beforehand. Um, and yeah, I feel like that is in, in to go to Rob's example in never die. Like a lot of the fights there are because, you know, it, they need to do this to accomplish a certain character objective. And also another part of this as well, which I would like to get into is 
using fight scenes as a way to actually convey character personality and develop characters. So Rob, do you want to talk a little bit through that? Um, sure. <laughs> I mean, I, I feel that there's, there's different ways to go into to writing a fight scene. I mean, like, like Dirk said, you, you can sort of like, you establish early on, do you want your fight scenes to be realistic or do you want them to be, um, you know, sort of like high octane bombastic sort of, Michael Bay movies um and that that's that's you know one of the sort of decisions you have to make and I think another one is how you want to write them you can write your fight scenes so that they focus more on the emotions of the people going through them or you can write them so they, so that they're they're focusing more on the moves and like you know the thoughts of the characters inside them as they're sort of like trying to to figure out um how to beat their opponent and that was something that i wanted to do in in never died personally i wanted it so that each of the characters when they got into a fight scene they considered it in a different way so you have a tommy cho who's sort of like the the samurai type character um and and like a like a samurai it's it's the idea of you know you're trying to finish a fight in one stroke so for her it's very much about analyzing the fight, the opponent, and figuring out where to, to you know, land the killing blow. Um, and, and then, you know, you have, like, different characters, like uh, I had Ayn Gut Chen, who, he, he didn't care how long the fight went on for, for him, it was just a way to, to uh, be the larger-than-life personality he is and grow his legend a bit more. Um, so for me, it was very much about writing each character's involvement in the fight scene and how it went on inside their personality inside their per perspective in a different way from the other characters that is a fantastic point um we're going to continue with this discussion about fight scenes in just a second but first we're going to pause for dirk to tell us about our featured book and then we'll probably go on to rj to get some more of your thoughts on a fight scene uh, so dirk can you take us away with our featured book for this week my my featured book for the day is Paternus, War of God. <laughs> this is book three of the Paternus trilogy, and anybody who's read it, they can see that it's quite a bit bigger than the other two. So that's my selling point. Buy this, read this series because the last book is longer than the others. <laughs> Sweet. That's about all. Do you want to tell us anything about the actual contents of the book or just the length? Oh, uh, the, the Paternus trilogy is, uh, it's, a lot of people have called it epic urban fantasy. Um, it, it, it does take place in uh, today, and at least it begins in this that we live in today. Um, but the myths and legends from around the world are real. Uh, the great wars, the great battles, uh, the characters, um, those people, uh, beings actually did exist, and some still do. Um, the bad guys and the good guys, and the age-old wars that have long been um, simmering uh, are, are the, the, the final battle is coming. Um, so it's, it, it is urban fantasy, but it's, uh, it is not your traditional wizard demon hunter or paranormal uh, urban fantasy. Uh, it's, it's structured far more like uh, an epic fantasy trilogy. So that's, Great. that's what it's about. It's so about that the war is... of the gods, every god from everywhere, all over time, all coming together and having a big uh, shindig. I have to, I have to thank Rob for he wrote an amazing review of, of this book after after having forced himself to suffer through the whole series. <laughs> it is an honor to have people read the whole thing, like Rob, who I respect tremendously as an author. So thank you, sir. <laughs> Oh, this is so wholesome. Um, <laughs> so the link to that will be in the show notes. Uh, and that whole series, that whole trilogy is complete now. So if you're one of those people who wants to have the series complete before you get into it, this is a good opportunity. Um, RJ, can you take us back into this discussion and talk about what are some things we've, we've missed with talking about fight scenes so far? Or what are some other kind of perspectives that you have on what makes good fight scenes? Um, I, th I think what makes a good fight scene is different for everyone, you can only talk about what you're trying to accomplish with them. Um, um, and I, I find violence and horror are, are just awful. And that's something I really want to get across 
with the fight scenes in, in my books. I don't really want you to walk away thinking, wow, that was cool. I want you to walk away thinking, I, I really never want to be involved in anything like that in my entire life. Um, one of my, my favorite things that have been said to me is, um, I know quite a lot of history people, and one of them uses blood of assassins. There's a, a cavalry charge in it. Um, and they use that, they get their students to read that bit. He said, because it, nothing else he's read gives the impression of how pants-shittingly terrifying medieval warfare would be. And, and that, that's what I want to get. I don't, uh, and it's the same in the, I mean, the, the fight sequence in the assassin books are all very close and all very third person, but I want to get across that sense of, he starts off, they're much, they're very one-on-one -on -one and, and he can control that and he understands it. And as the books go on, they get bigger and more and more terrifying. Um, and I want that sense of chaos and that notion that you could actually die at any moment and you would never see it and it hurts and it's deeply unpleasant and you don't want to be there. And then when it came to the bone ships, that's a totally different type of battle because that's a lot of it's ship on ship, which is massive and, and you need a bigger perspective. Uh, and that, that was all about, it, it's all about character. And that was about Joran growing because he, he's terrified of violence. He, he sees his father crushed between the hull of two ships at the beginning of the book. You got beginning of the book, bit of a spoiler, but never mind. Um, it's the journey, not the destination. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so he's very aware of, of the frailty of his body. Uh, and if you're on a ship of war, you literally have to stand there taking the shot until your ship's in the right place. And I want to get across how, firstly, how utterly terrifying that must be. And secondly, sort of the growth of someone to slowly realizing actually, it's not me that's a coward and everyone else is really brave. We all feel this. We, we just learn not to show it. And, and the books are in, in a way about becoming, in, not feeling that violence and starting to, it become part of you and it, it becomes addictive. It, it, the adrenaline rush and that sort of runs through the, the entire books but yeah chaos chaos and terror and and that's what i want in a fight scene i don't want to like it particularly mm -hmm. yeah, there needs to be a cost that's, mm. that's yeah. the one thing you know there has to be uh some shit has to come out of it you know mm. at, the, at the end the empty fight scenes where everyone's kind of okay afterwards uh you know and you kind of the writer immediately forgets about uh, all the flesh wounds and the fact that it's fucking exhausting well, to fight, yeah. you know? Uh, yeah. Cost, mm -hmm. I would say critical. Yeah, mm -hmm. in the kingdom is, is a mess. He, he, he hates it and he, he has nowhere else to go. It's, it's all he can be and he doesn't want to be it, but he just happens to be very good at killing people. But I don't think you ever get the feeling that he's going, yay, swords. And also, they, they are quite realistic, apart from the fact he's magically helped a bit, because I, I, I've done fencing and stuff like that, so it's all, it's all in there, but I don't particularly pay attention to I wouldn't choose realism over stuff I needed to do for plot at any point, ever. <laughs> or character, yeah. yeah. I think the cost thing's point. fairly important, but I think a lot, of, um, a lot of authors get hung up on the physical cost, so any sort of, like, you know they'll try and ah my character was injured and you know that. but there's also I think the the emotional cost which is obviously the thing that um, RJ is trying to get across with, with a lot of his yeah. books is the fact that you know okay they may grow to love the the sort of like the violence or at least not love it but crave it like an addiction but at the same time it's gonna take its toll on them from a sort of like mental um, emotional aspect um, and could well leave them with some serious emotional scarring I feel um, and I think that's that's the sort of thing that a lot of authors may not sort of like um, put into their books they'll, they'll concentrate on the physical physical cost and leave the emotional cost out of it yeah I think there's, there's a lot of pain in what I do because in some ways I mean we, we channel in our writing our own experiences and I've been chronically ill and there's a lot of pain involved in that as well and it kind of it was put into Girton. Girton is, is sort of an avatar for all those things. That the, um, when he's fighting he uses a breath technique um, to control his fear but that, that's actually pain management techniques that I've just put into the book and I kind of used them like that so you kind of there's always sort of layers of metaphor in whatever you write of what's what's going on.
that's my clever thing for this podcast. <laughs> that is a fantastic topic to uh, do a podcast on someday. Yeah. The metaphors beneath. Yeah. 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 I think we all, we all do it. E- even when people yeah. talk about books being simplistic, and I think, no, they're, they're not, because you can't see what's going on in that writer's mind below that, what they're actually talking about. There's, no book is simplistic. No. There's always something. I mean, they, yeah, I mean, you guys have brought up so many things. I'm not sure what I want to talk about, but uh, you know, the, a fight scene needs to exist. Uh, there are a lot of fight scenes. They they need to advance either character or plot. Um, and you know, action for action's sake, action scenes in movies are often people's favorites. And I think of mine as as those, but I try to make it so that there is a cost. I mean, a character grows by learning what they can and can't do physically. There's the technical aspect, um, but also they have to deal with the aftermath of it. And I kind of, I don't do, I don't do the clean, you know, old fashioned epic fantasy or, uh, you know, PG, G rated action uh, where it's rather clean and there's not a lot of blood. And, and I, I mean, I do talk about, I mean, battle, when people are getting their guts spilled, I mean, it stinks too, you know, just the, the God awful. I re- I've read a lot of, um, of stories of actual war, like Vietnam, what, what a fight is like when you pull a bayonet out of someone, you know, there are certain things that happen when you do that. You know, so I do, I try to add some of that in sometimes a little bit. That's my books sometimes get called grimdark because of that kind of, you know, people do piss and shit their pants as they die. It happens on occasion. So I put, I try not to do too much of that, but I wanted to make it realistic. The whole thing, part of the reason I also wrote in present tense is that immediacy, that urgency, like Mm -hmm. Rob was talking about and that reality of the situation. So in this completely unreal situation with these unreal characters, I try to throw in that reality to just shock us back a little bit to, to reality, basically. Um, Have you written something and just thought, oh, we should not. Uh, <laughs> something so horrific, you're like, oh God, why did I do that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I've actually gone back and and pulled some things that I thought were just too, too nasty. Funnily enough, I've done that in a sex scene before. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in another... King of Assassins, there's, there's a burning sequence. Someone's burnt alive, I, and I, I hate it. And when I read it to edit before I sent it off to Orbit, I was like, oh, God, I wish I'd not put that in. Um, so if <laughs> Jenny will take it out. My editor, she's really, she's sort of going, you've gone too far. She'll take it out. It'll be fine. I sent it to her and it came back to me with a note that just said, I love this. Okay. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> like Every time I was like, oh, no, I don't. I can't bear this. Oh. Yeah. I guess that's sort of a good thing. Um, <laughs> one thing <laughs> I would like to just point out quickly as well is like, we, we have talked a lot about how, you know, like it's cool when fight scenes are sort of cinematic and we have talked a bit about references to to film in our fight scenes as well. Um, I find that it's also important to recognize that in a story, you are playing with a different set of tools. So you don't have the ability to have, you know, like you can show you cool stunts in a story, but it's probably not going to have as much effect on the viewer or be as clear as that action unfolding on screen because screen, it's all there. There's no confusion. Whereas when you're describing it, you have to worry about choreography and all those sort of things. But I think what we've touched upon in this episode is that you can focus on other things in a fight scene in a book that filmmakers don't necessarily have. You can be more introspective. You can look more into the emotions and kind of describe like the smells and the sounds um, and kind of just like the, the texture, I suppose, of the fight in a way that is mm. unique to stories and everything. Um, we have about a couple of minutes left before this particular recording wraps up. Um, what are the things, perhaps this is something we can use to close out or we can talk about something else happy either way. Um, what do you think are common mistakes that people make when they're writing fight scenes in books and how can we avoid those? 
when everybody fights kind of the same way. Um, there, uh, I, I tried really hard and I don't know if I accomplished it, but to give everyone a different kind of style in the way that they, not in the, in the way they both approached and thought about battle and in the way that they actually fought. Um, uh, I try to give them each, um, I mean, we, we've seen the whole, they all have a favorite weapon right? Well, that's, it, that, that's important because it's true, but even if everyone's using swords, they can all fight in a, in a different manner. And that helps, I think, especially in a book like mine that has a cast of thousands. I think it helps the, the reader uh, keep track of what character is what. Um, some of them say, you know, funny things as they fight. Some of them scream and yell as they fight. Some of them are completely silent. Um, but they also use different techniques and approach fighting um, differently. So I think, that, I think that's something that, um, especially with new writers, you don't really see often enough. Either that or it's, taking way, it's taken way overboard. If that makes sense. It does, yeah. yeah. Never forget your uh, point of view character. Filter everything through them, the emotions, you know, whoever's your, your POV character during that fight. You got to keep in mind, like, all of their personality up until that point so that the fight makes sense still, like, from their point of view. To me, like, point of view and your whoever your point of view character is kind of literally is your story. Uh, plot is this sort of idea that I don't know somebody made up. It's not real. So everything is is point of view. And it fights too. I I really agree with that one actually because I some of the the worst battle scenes I've ever read are ones where, despite the fact that it's it's written inside one person's perspective, the battle or fight feels like they know exactly what's going on all the all the time. So you know they they, they know that there's like three guys over there fighting, and there's like six guys, and then there's a sword coming from behind me, and you just like <laughs> but then when you're in a fight i mean i've never been in an actual fight but i've been in like <laughs> i've been in a couple of shield walls um you you just know that there's a thing coming at you right there and you don't want it to hit you and you're trying to, uh. <laughs> so there's that whole idea of the the chaos of it and yeah it you don't see everything that's going on around you, you and you quite often don't see the thing that gets you either so yeah mm. like, like michael said like concentrating in that perspective that that's written from and not trying to make it so that they know everything that's going on around the battle all at the same time. I'm not, I'm not one for pointing out mistakes. I think one person's just doesn't work for me is another person's brilliant. So it's difficult, hmm. difficult to say what, what I think is a mistake. But just like me saying, I, I abhor violence and I want you to walk away from my books thinking, oh, I never want to be in that situation. Um, like Rob, the nearest I've ever come to real violence is hiding in a toilet while other people had a fight. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, it can't be boring because it, cause it's, a, it's a peak moment in your book. It, it, it has to, like, it's difficult to come into a book on a fight because you don't know these people, so why do you care? But it, that's not to say it can't be done. But usually you'll have that. I always think of a book as a series of waves. You go up and down and up further and then down. And the fights are often those those bits, so it can't can't be boring. Like my saying stakes have to be there. It has to matter at, and it has to move. Uh, it has to have that sort of sense of flow and movement through the fight. That's that's I think I think well, that's what makes a fight makes a fight work for me. So that might because of background fencing. So that kind of, it is dancey. Yeah. It's not. So do, so do I. And that's mm -hmm. Uh, oh, too much detail. I was going to say yeah. that is a mistake I see. Like blow by blow of descriptions. Yeah, and and every move, every foot, every step of the foot, every move, every yeah, too much mm. technical, too much technical description. Now it's better to air that way on a first draft because you can always go back and combine and cut things out um, than it is to air on too little. I think so. Um, but yeah, I've, I've read books that just have far too much blow by blow um, 
actual every single stick, every single thrust, every single swipe, you know, lovingly detailed. Um, he turned uh, his wrist 13 degrees to the right post. <laughs> no, I, I, but we've, I've read stuff like that, you know, that's pretty similar. I mean, yeah. you, you, can, you can certainly have bits of that in, in, a, in like a, a fight scene, but then you can also just, you can pull back to the, the, the hole where they're sort of like going, and then, and then they were just blocking, and then they were stabbing, and then you, you move into sort of like the rhythm of it, the, 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 the feel of it, the song of it, and then, you know, that's when you can sort of like maybe describe the character's emotion or whatever as well as you know, the, the thrill of the battle gets to them or the fact that they, they realize that they're losing and suddenly that's, the fear starts to get in. Yeah, yeah. I think it's knowing, knowing what you want to do and why you're doing it. Mm. That's, that's, if, if you have a moment of, of extreme detail, then knowing why it's there, not doing it because you know a lot about a thing, um, that, that's the wrong reason to do it. If you're doing it to show how much you know about sword fighting, that then the reader will be bored. If if you're doing it to give a little glimpse into the fact that character really knows what they're doing, and then you just skip past it, then then, then that's a, a good reason for doing it. But don't do it for a long time because people will still get bored. I think it's a really good tip just for writing in general that the reader needs to know a lot less about a thing than you do. You you need to know everything. They need to know hardly anything at all about stuff. You're writing a story, not a technical manual. Yes. Mm. Yes. And I think that's a good point to wrap up this episode on. Um, I realize we probably should have done this on the first episode you were around, RJ. But uh, before we close out, do you want to just tell our listeners slash viewers where they can find you um, and read your books? Oh, you can find me on Twitter. If you search for RJ Barker, you'll find me because my Twitter handle is ridiculous. And no one can spell it, and I should change it. <laughs> but um, I'm always on Twitter, and, and I'll chat to anybody on it. Um, and my books are in most major bookshops. Buy it from your local indie because they need the help at the moment. Um, and they are Age of Assassins, Blood of Assassins, King of Assassins, and the Bone Ships, and Call of the Bone Ships, which is on its way in November. That was very professional. Fantastic. Got the, yeah, usually, Back. I get the order of them wrong. Knocked it out of the park this time. And uh, if you are watching the video feed, Rob did just point to some of those books, I believe. So thank you, Rob, for being our visual props person. Um, what a team, Rob. I'm fist bumping Rob. <laughs> He's our Vanna White. <laughs> Alrighty. Um, okay, thank you so much for listening or watching. As always, if you have comments um, or questions for us, feel free to hit us up on Twitter or just drop them in if you're watching the YouTube below. Um, thank you so much for listening and we will see you next time. Hi, everybody. Thank you for listening to Wizards, Warriors, and Words. We hope you learned something useful. Let us know what you thought about this episode in the comments below. We'll do our best to respond. We'd also love to hear your questions. Comment with your questions below, and we might even answer it on the show. If you haven't already, please subscribe and like this video. This helps more people discover the show. Wizards, Warriors, and Words is jointly hosted by Dirk Ashton, Michael R. Fletcher, Rob J. Hayes, and Jed Hearn, with editing by Jed Hearn. Our music comes from Michael R. Fletcher, and our artwork is by Felix Ortiz. Thank you again for watching. Now go and write extraordinary stories. We'll see you next time.